When you're married to an English woman, as I am, one of the things that goes with the territory is you're expected to do some gardening. You all know that the English are great gardeners. Now, I know a little bit about gardening. Uh, my grandfather had a big vegetable garden, so I know how to dig potatoes and pick peas and things like that. But I'm pretty hopeless when it comes to flower gardening, to be honest with you. I, I have my uses. I can dig a hole. I can carry some soil. I can throw some water on a plant once in a while. But mostly I have a brown thumb. If you come in my office, you'll notice that my staff periodically has to remind me to water the, little, the peace lily that uh, Judith gave me. Uh, so I'm not very good at gardening, but I do know this. In order to get beautiful, healthy plants, like roses, for, for instance, you have to give them some attention. You have to give them some pruning. They need tender, loving care. And in our gospel today, Jesus uses an extended metaphor to describe the vital relationship between God the Father, himself, and us as his disciples. He says, I am the vine, and my Father is the vine grower, or more simply, the gardener. And we, as disciples, are branches. Now, in the Hebrew scriptures and in the, in the tradition of Israel, Israel was often portrayed as either a vineyard or a vine. It is one of the images that was used of the people of Israel. We see it repeatedly in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and many other passages of scripture. Let me just give one example from Psalm 80. Actually, the beginning of that psalm starts with a good shepherd metaphor, so it kind of fits from last week. The psalmist writes, You brought a vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. Now, so common was this image of the vineyard or the vine that in the temple of Jesus' day, uh, the Jewish writer Josephus writes that on the pillars at the entrance to the temple, there were golden vines wrapped around those pillars. So that is an image of Israel, the vine. So what does Jesus mean when he says, I am the true vine? There's a little bit there about I am that I won't go into, but the true vine. Well, oftentimes, when we have these images of Israel as the vine, it is also cast as a way in which they failed the Lord. They failed to be a fruitful vine. So, for example, Isaiah says this, The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the people of Judah are his pleasant planting. He expected justice, but saw bloodshed righteousness but heard a cry or take this from jeremiah yet i planted you as a choice vine from the purest stock how then did you turn degenerate and become a wild vine so israel is often portrayed as the vine supposed to be fruitful but also portrayed as having failed in that mission so when jesus says I am the true vine, he is saying, I am come to fulfill all the promises that Israel failed to fulfill. So in this Easter season, we're hearing many passages and verses about how Jesus fulfilled all the law and the prophets. So he is the true Israel. And by extension, we are a part of that calling of Jesus because we are in Christ. So in this gardening metaphor in John 15, there are three main verbs that appear. And I want to use those as the center part of my sermon this morning. And they describe our relationship to God the Father and to Jesus Christ as the vine. And those three verbs are translated abide, cleanse, and bear fruit. We'll take each of them in order. So to begin with, first we are to abide in the vine. 
to abide in the vine. To abide can also be translated to remain or to continue in Jesus. Now, before Annette and I came to California last, uh, in the latter part of last year, we were living in England. And we had a huge garden out behind our house. It was enormous. You could play football in that backyard. And our Polish gardener would come every two or three weeks and mow and trim and do all the things that you do in a garden. Uh, fortunately, we had a gardener. It was very nice to have that. And one day, after he had finished mowing and doing all his work, he left. And Annette looked out the back conservatory window. And she said, oh, Yurik planted a tree. And sure enough, I looked out there. And there, beside some other trees, was a beautiful tree with leaves. It was, it was only about five feet tall. And I said, oh, that was very nice that he planted that little tree there. We'll have to take care of it. So over the days to come, I, I'm watching this little tree. And I'm getting worried because we were going through a spell that is a little bit unusual in England called a dry spell. If you know anything about England, that's an unusual occurrence. So, but we had, were going through a couple of weeks where it didn't really rain. And if I, I said I don't know a lot about plants, but one thing I know is if you're going to establish a tree, you really need to water that tree every day for the first couple weeks at least. Unfortunately, my hose didn't reach that far down into the garden. So what I was doing is I was filling up Annette's uh, little watering can about five, six times and making these trips down to water this tree every day. So here I am watering this tree, but I'm looking at it saying, something's not right with this tree. It's got leaves on it, but no matter how much I water this tree, the leaves are withering, all the branches are really starting to droop. Something's wrong here. This goes on for about two weeks, and Yerrick is away at this point. So one day I look out, and we've had a little bit of a windstorm, and our tree has tipped over. It's leaning over like this. So I said, well, he didn't stake it, so I better go out and stake this little tree and see if I can get, bring this tree la back to life. So I go out, and I go to lift the tree up to kind of straighten up, and I kind of pull up, and it pulls right out of the ground. And to my horror, I discover that this isn't a tree at all. There is no root ball at the bottom of this thing. All there is is a little cut-off section. All Yarrick did was cut off a, sec a limb and stick it in the ground. So for the last two weeks, I've basically been watering a stick. There was no way that this stick was going to grow. It was absolutely impossible because it had been cut off. It had been cut off from the life flow that is necessary for every plant and every living thing. We have to abide in Christ. To abide means to have that vital connection. The Christ life needs to flow into and through us if we are to have eternal life. And it begins with our baptism. The Ethiopian makes the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he is baptized. Or as our epistle puts it in 1 John 4.15, God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God and they abide in God. Here in a few moments, we're going to stand, we're going to say the creed that we say every Sunday. That is really a reaffirmation of our faith in Jesus Christ, God the Father and the Holy Spirit, and how we believe that we have to have that vital connection with Christ and let his life flow up flow through us. To abide means we have to seek those things that help us to have that connection. The old, old writers used to call them means of grace, means that allow the, the things of the Spirit to flow in and through our life. So when you come to worship, the mere fact that you are here this morning or watching on Facebook Live or later on watching on YouTube, you are maintaining that connection when you search the scriptures, when you pray, when you fellowship with one another, when you think about your neighbors, you are maintaining that connection with Jesus Christ. And most importantly, when you receive the Eucharist. All those ways are maintaining and abiding in Christ. 
And if we do not abide in him, we can do nothing and the life of Christ is not within us. Now, as we abide in Christ, we are also cleansed by the Father. We're cleansed. You could translate it pruned, and really the word is the same, and there's a little word play that happens in the Greek here. Let me read it. It says that the Father removes, iro, every branch in him that bears no fruit, every branch that bear, bears fruit, he Kathiro prunes it to make it bear more fruit. And you have already been cleansed, Kathiro, by the word that I have spoken to you. So Jesus and John are using a little word play here. They mean pruned or cleansed. They all mean basically the same thing depending on how you use them. Well, why do we prune a tree or a rose bush? Well, first we want to remove dead wood. For one, it makes the plant look more attractive. Have you ever seen those trees that all the suckers are growing out of them? And it just doesn't look good. So we want to make it look good. We we prune it and trim it and do what we need to. It also makes the plant healthier. And ultimately, whether you're looking for fruit or good vegetables or you're looking for, for beautiful roses or beautiful flowers, pruning or trimming makes for better fruit and more beautiful flowers. Now, we can also apply this to the Christian life. It might be that God the Father needs to prune things out of our lives that are sinful or harmful, hindering our life in Christ. They may be things that that are keeping us from experiencing all that God has for us. So God may trim those things out. But it can also be something perfectly fine in and of itself. Because pruning isn't just about removing the bad. It is also removing sometimes good growth. There's nothing wrong with it in particular. But you want to have healthier fruit or more fruit. So there's things that we might have in our lives that are perfectly fine in and of themselves. Activities, hobbies we like to do. You might enjoy golf, reading romance novels, or even gardening. None of these things are bad in and of themselves. They're all good. But you have to ask yourself, are they hindering in any way your life in Christ? And if they are, you might want God to do a little pruning work. And as we read the word, Jesus says, we're cleansed through the word that we receive. As we read the word and as we hear the word and study the scriptures, the Holy Spirit may speak to us about what needs to go or what needs to change in our life. Now that happens on an individual basis. But I want to suggest to you that this cleansing, this pruning, can also apply to us as a church. Are there things that are unhelpful? Are there things that need to be cleansed or pruned within our church, within our life? Perhaps we need to be cleansed a little bit in terms of love. We read this morning from 1 John. The commandment we have is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Maybe we need a little pruning there. Are there programs or activities that we engage in as a church? They may not need removing. They may be perfectly fine. They may just need a little tidying up. A little make them a little cleaner so that they are more productive. I'm not saying what those things are. But what I am asking you to do as a church is to prayerfully consider, prayerfully consider what needs pruning, what needs cleansing within our church. So we abide in the vine Christ and the Father cleanses us, prunes us. But as we do that, it's all for one purpose, to bear fruit, to bear fruit. Now, what is the fruit John, Jesus is talking about here in the Gospel of John? It's not particularly defined. But we know that Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. So we know that love is an aspect. And we've already heard from 1 John this morning about lo- we must love our brothers and sisters. So I think we're on safe ground. And even in a few verses after our passage this morning, in John 15, 12, Jesus says, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. 
So we're on safe ground saying that love is an element of our fruitfulness. But I think there's another aspect that is, requires our attention. Jesus says, my father is glorified in that you bear fruit and become my disciples. If love is part of the fruit, then I think another part of that is loving our neighbors and our friends, our co-workers enough to share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. Paul in Colossians says, all the world, uh, in all of the uh, world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you have heard it. In other words, more and more people are coming into the church, into the assembly, becoming disciples. When Philip followed the leading of the Spirit, he was led to the Ethiopian eunuch. He shared with him the good news of Jesus Christ. The Ethiopian eunuch was baptized and became a member of the church, became one of the branches. In fact, the Ethiopian church to this day looks back to that event as the beginning of the, the church in Ethiopia. I noticed that one of the values that you have listed on the outside of the church there is evangelical. And I know that word sometimes has baggage for people. It has a little baggage for me too. But in its truest sense, it means that the fruit of love will cause us to share the good news and see others grafted in as branches becoming followers, disciples of Jesus Christ. I want to conclude with this promise from Jesus. He says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So this is a promise about prayer, that our prayers will be answered. But there are two conditions. We must abide in Christ and Christ's words must abide in us. So I have a prayer challenge for you this week and actually in the weeks and months to come. For yourself, for yourself individually, ask God to give you a deep, abiding, continuing, rich relationship in Jesus Christ. Ask God to prune from you all that is not holy and all that is not helpful in your Christian life. And ask God to increase in you the fruit of the Spirit, most of all, love. And if it should so lead you, love that will reach to another neighbor. Maybe even invite them to come to St. Francis. And I want you to pray for us as a community. Will you pray for your clergy? Will you pray for your wardens, for your vestry, for every program and committee, every part of St. Francis, that we may be instruments of God's grace, God's grace to draw us into a deeper communion with Jesus Christ. Pray that God may prune our church of all that is unnecessary, all that is not helpful, to make us more effective in our ministry of love. And pray that we would have a love that reaches out into our community and world and announces the good news of Jesus Christ. Remember this. Apart from Jesus, you can do nothing. May you and us together be a branch of the church known as St. Francis, abiding in Christ and bearing fruit to the glory of God. I offer this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.